Okay, thanks everybody for joining in our September educational webinar. Um, this week, well, this month, we really focused on the digestive supplements. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about probiotics, prebiotics, antibiotics. Um, but first of all, I think it's really important to start with digestive function. Uh, some of you have seen these slides. Some of you have heard me talk about it before. But until we understand the digestive system, we don't really understand why on earth we need these other supplements, okay? You know, a lot of people will say, I want to have my horse on a, on a probiotic or a prebiotic or a digestive aid, which is great, but ultimately you need to know why. And as dealers selling these products, you need to know why they need them. Um, and then obviously we'll talk about the difference between antibiotic, probiotic, prebiotic, and then talk about some of our um the the products that we're uh highlighting this month as well as some of those all tech technologies that we put in the products and some of the science um the actual research that goes with so again you know a lot of times i'm uh, answering the question of why dac versus a smart pack supplement or uh something else so, first of all, digestive function, the evolution of the horse. On the left-hand side, this is what horses are designed to do. They're designed to eat a wide variety of forages, graze between, you know, 17 to 24 hours a day, really, move around, stand in a herd, eat off the ground. The benefits of eating off the ground allows natural drainage of the respiratory, respiratory tract, increases chewing time, prevents muscular tension in the neck and back, and it maintains proper teeth alignment. I guarantee there's very, very few horses that live in that more natural environment. On the right-hand side, this is the more modern way of keeping horses. You know, that horse is in a stall. He's got a bucket ch hanging at chest height that he's eating out of. He's probably eating a wide variety of cereal grains because we need that extra energy. He's not eating off the ground. He's not socializing. He's not with a group of horses. Um, can become frustrated to, due to confinement. But nothing about this scenario is normal to the digestive function of the horse. So that is the first indicator that perhaps we need to help this horse because we're ch completely changing his digestive environment. So none of you have probably seen these slides. I recently gave a talk to a group of veterinarians on the importance of forage in the diet, and I wanted to add some more science to it. You know, we talk about, um, I usually skip right to the uh, stomach as the first part of the digestive system, but this is this is neat to look at. So when horses in the wild are chewing or out with 100% access to grazing all the time, they're going to chew around 60,000 times a day. You take that same 1,100-pound horse and you stick him in a stall, it takes him about 40 minutes or about 3,400 chews per 2.2 pounds. Excuse all of these are in kilos, but one kilo equals 2.2 pounds. So for every two pounds of hay, it's going to take him about 40 minutes and about 3,400 chews. It's only going to take him about 850 chews and 10 minutes to chew two pounds of oats. So let's take our average feeding scenario. We've got a horse in a stall. He's eating one and a half percent of body weight in hay. So he's eating around 15 pounds of hay. That's 2,500 chews. Well, we throw in some oats, either three kilos or six kilos. Let's put in the six kilos or 12 pounds of oats a day. Add that to the amount of chews in the hay. He's still only chewing 30,000 times a day. The horse that's grazing is going to chew 60,000 times. So even if he's getting 15 pounds of hay and 12 pounds of oats, He's still only chewing 30,000, half the amount of time. We think, well, what's the point of showing us this? When horses chew, they produce saliva. Saliva helps to buffer stomach acid. We've talked about stomach ulcers being huge. We're not, 
highlighting the cool gut this month, but research has shown that the faster horses chew, they have teeth issues, they choke more. Um, so, so number one, adding enough forage to the diet has dental ramifications, as well as later on when we go through the rest of the digestive system, there are other digestive ramifications. The esophagus. In a person, if you choke on your food, you can't breathe because your windpipe and where your food goes down is the same thing. In a horse, though, they're two separate, you know, we have this soft palate here, right, kind of where the throat latch goes on the bridle. That's kind of a gate that opens and shut, and then there are two distinct tubes, one for the wind, for their air, and one for the food. Um, <clears throat> so if your horse is choking on food, he's still going to be able to breathe, but he's going to cough and cough, and what happens is that food may actually get aspirated. It'll, he'll cough it up and cough it up, and it'll come back up to here, and it may aspirate down that windpipe. Can everyone see my pointer? Can people see my pointer? Type in the box, somebody, if you can see my pointer. Okay. Thanks, Susie. Um, so, again, and it's very important to make sure that you slow down eating. The slower they eat, the more they chew. The more they chew, the more saliva they produce. That saliva helps to lubricate the food as it's going down the, the esophagus. It also helps to buffer that stomach acid. Horses that eat really quickly also aren't digesting it as well. There was a study done in 2014 said when they looked at fecal particle size, so the particle size in the manure was much bigger when horses ate faster because they're not digesting the food. They're not breaking it down as quick as they should be as good as they should be, I should say. So let's move to the stomach. It's really small in relation to the rest of the digestive system. Less than two hours, sometimes only 30 minutes for food to pass through the stomach. It's full of acid. Most of you have seen this picture if you've seen me do a, a presentation for you. The bottom part of the stomach is full of acid and it's, it's this dark pink tissue and it's got the slimy mucus coating that protects that tissue. Well, if you're constantly chewing like a horse in the wild, you're constantly producing saliva, you're constantly got something down in the bottom part of the stomach that's buffering the stomach acid. But that's not what happens in our modern horses. In modern horses, around 87 or 90% of horses, performance horses have gastric ulcers. Um, <clears throat> any Amish customers on the call? Your buggy horses, your work horses, they are performance horses. And over 60% have colonic ulcers in the hindgut, and over half the population have them in both places. Now, what's the cause of this? Well, because we're fasting them. We're making them stand in stalls. How many of your horses have something to chew on? If they're in a stall, have something to chew on 17 hours out of the day. There are very few. So we have these high-grain, low-roughage diets where we're transporting them or stabling them, doing a lot of exercise. Um, they have a lot of aches and pains. We're expecting them to live a long time, so we have them on non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Butte. So this this is really neat. <clears throat> so what this is, on, on the left-hand side here, this is the pH. As it goes down here around zero, that's super, super strong acid, like worse than lemon juice. As you go up, seven is neutral. This is nice up here. <clears throat> so... <coughs> Above 4 pH in the stomach, that's where we like that acid to sit. That's, that's a good place for it to sit. Below 4, excuse me, <coughs> and we're going to start to see the negative effects of a high acid diet, a high acid environment. So let's look. After simply one hour, one hour of not having any food in the stomach, the acid is consistently way down in this bad. So, you know, between 1 and 2, consistently between 1 and 2 pH. That's very strong acid, and that's not good. Studies have shown at 18 hours of not having, of, of having the acid low like that, we're going to get bleeding lesions. Less than 6 hours of interval between feeds. So you feed your horse at, 
at 6 and then you feed them again at lunchtime. If you've got longer than that, if you've got longer than 6 hours where there's nothing sitting in the horse's stomach, whether you're transporting them or whatever, you're increasing your risk of gastric ulcers. We're already seeing reddening of the tissue after six hours of not having anything in the stomach. It's not uncommon, <coughs> especially as we go into the winter time, 5 p.m. night feed, done their hay by 7. It's all out of the stomach. Next feed's not till 7 a.m. That's 12 hours of feed deprivation. There's going to be a lot of ulcers going on. Um, so small intestine, if we move to the small intestine, there's no bacteria here, there's enzymes here that break down primarily your sugars and starches. Um, one of the whole, you know, reasons why we have to feed these digestive supplements is to stabilize the pH in the hindgut. And the pH in the hindgut, that acidity, is strong because we feed too much grain in a single meal. It overloads the small intestine. The small intestine can't keep up. So we've got an enzyme called amylase. There's only a certain amount of it. If we overload or saturate the small intestine, all of the starch that it can digest gets digested, but then there's still more that's not digested. That flows through to the hindgut. The bacteria that are breaking down starches go crazy. They end up creating this very acidic environment. There's this kind of magic number of 0.4% of body weight. So for that 1,000-pound uh, horse, it's about mm, 4 pounds of starch um, per day, per meal, that that's where you're going to overload the gut. And that's very easy to do when you're feeding large quantities of your corn, oat, barley, or sweet feed type feed. Um, from here on back, this is what we call the <clears throat> hind gut of the horse. Okay? We have the cecum is a blind sac. It's like a balloon. It has the same entry and exit point. Full of bacteria. These fiber digestor, digesters, they really like the pH to be up around 6, 6 to 7. Those starch digesters that are going to make it more acidic, they're preferring to be between 5 and 6. But if you get too much of that starch being digested, it's going to pull that <clears throat> pH down even lower than that. So we want to make sure that we're balancing out the pH to encourage fiber digestion. And we want to make sure that we're getting the starch digested in the small intestine <clears throat> so that it's not flowing through to the hindgut and pulling down that pH, which is going to cause colonic ulcers. <clears throat> so the large colon, um, after the cecum, before the small colon, it becomes um, easily twisted. These pockets, if we get those bacteria out of sync, um, we will get pockets of gas because those bacteria will produce gas. And what happens if you put gas in kind of a balloon? It'll float up. It'll twist around. Um, and you can see it takes a long time, the rate of passage, to get through the this fiber digesting region of the gut <clears throat> is a long time. So it'll be up around the 65 hours, the, the less digestible that fiber is. So again, if the even the best quality hay is only about 50% digestible. So if you want your horses to get the most out of the hay that you're feeding, <clears throat> we need to be feeding ingredients <clears throat> that are going to make that fiber more digestible. <clears throat> so let's look at colonic ulcers. They typically happen in the right dorsal colon. Some vets will call it right dorsal colitis or RDC. It's definitely less frequent but more severe than gastric ulcers. You saw how small the stomach was in relation to the rest of the digestive system. <clears throat> that stomach you know how much pain a horse can be in and how much it changes that horse's behavior if they have stomach ulcers. Now take that colon, which is huge, and fill that with ulcers. You can now see that we're going to have a lot more intermittent colic symptoms, a lot more pain is a, 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 um, and a lot more inflammatory markers. So what, what is going to be key here? Okay, well, pellet or cube forage, because you start putting long stem forage on that, and it's going to be very painful. 
So we want that pellet turtle cubed forage for about four weeks. Um, <clears throat> the live cell yeast culture or the yeast extract. The research has shown, and I'll show you the research, the graphs, that it is able to Incre decrease the acidity, so make the pH go back up around that 6-7. Increase the environment for those fiber digest digesters and decrease that acidic environment that's causing these ulcers. The yeast is a key ingredient in the cool gut and in the DDA, the digestive feed additive. Also, anytime you can take away <coughs> calories that are coming from those cereal grains that are causing this problem to start with, and replace it with calories from fat, i.e. the DAC oil, that's ideal. The DAC oil also has the vitamin E, which is going to be an antioxidant. Um, <clears throat> you can see here also the omega-3s. The omega-3s are going to decrease inflammation, the DHA. Also grazing these horses around 10 to 15 minutes, four to six times a day, if we know that we've got really severe gastro uh, colonic ulcers. So the small colon is really, we've sucked all the moisture, we've got all that non-digestible fiber, forms fecal balls. So <clears throat> that's a brief overview of the digestive system. You need to understand the digestive system. You need to understand what's happening in which parts to understand why you need to feed probiotics or prebiotics. Also to understand where they're going to function. So if someone tells you, oh, I'm just feeding a bit of brewer's yeast, and that's going to help in my horse's hindgut, well, no, it's not, because is it going to get through the acidity in the stomach? If somebody's feeding papaya juice and says, well, that's going to help with my colonic ulcers, no, that's not going to get through the, the acidity of the stomach. It may give a bit of short-term mucus <clears throat> uh, building to the kind of mucusy area in the stomach, but after that, the acid's going to wear it away. The enzymes in the small intestine are going to wear it away. It is no benefit to the hindgut of the horse. So what's an antibiotic? And you know I hate having a lot of text on a slide, but so that you can take these and read over these again. <clears throat> an antibiotic, break it into the two words, anti and biotic. <clears throat> anti means against, and biotic comes from the Greek word bioticus, which means life. So anti-life, against life. So antibiotics are agents to prevent and treat infection. They're going to be in there to kill bacteria and microbes. They're going to kill everything. <clears throat> Probiotics, break it up. Pro meaning for life. Again, biotic, or pro meaning for, and biotic meaning life. Now we're not against life, we're for life. So probiotics <clears throat> are live microbes that are used as agents to alter the composition metabol or metabolic activities of those bacteria. So they're going to they're going to help <clears throat> support that bacterial population. The most commonly used probiotics are lactic acid bacteria, including Lactobacillus enterococcus and Bifidobacterium. So if you look these are also called direct-fed microbials, or DFM, on some feed labels, and some yeasts. Now, yeasts like uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that can sit in both, both places. It can sit as a probiotic and a prebiotic. Some will argue that it's not a probiotic because it's not alive. Uh, in, in some forms that we feed it, it's not a live bacteria, <clears throat> but it's an encapsulated bacteria and it's more the bacteria extract, probiotics have to be live. So most people will consider your lactobacillus, enterococcus, your bifidobacterium, they're live microbes that you're putting into the gut, <clears throat> and they are your probiotics. Your prebiotics are food ingredients, usually types of carbohydrates um, or yeast, to certain parts of the yeast, that they're not digested in the stomach or the small intestine. They make it all the way to the hindgut of the horse, and they stimulate the growth of those good bacteria, the lactobacillus, the bifidobacteria. Prebiotics are food ingredients that, when eaten, reduce bad bacteria and increase good bacteria. They're either feeding good bacteria or they're binding bad bacteria. 
Um, so we've got a comment here. How do bacteria die or become useless? Well, <clears throat> if we have an environment in the hindgut of the horse that is very acidic or you're only feeding the hindgut one type of food, so you're feeding your horse a high grain diet with very little fiber, your fiber digesting bacteria have nothing to eat, so they're going to die. Or if you have a very starchy environment, but you still have some fiber in there, <clears throat> the bacteria that are breaking down sugars and starches are really proliferating. They're making a very acidic environment, and that acidic environment is not amenable to these other bacteria, those fiber digesting bacteria that don't like it so acidic, so they die. Um, <clears throat> so we need to make sure we're feeding those probiotics to stabilize the pH, that we're feeding the prebiotics to feed the good bacteria that are also going to help stabilize the pH, <clears throat> and also the prebiotics like the moss, the mananolagosaccharide, they have, shown, have been shown to bind bad bacteria like salmonella, E. coli, campylobacter, and flush them out of the horse's digestive system. So if we look at those old tech technologies, we start with the whole yeast. This is the yeast sac, 1026. <clears throat> we take the internal part of that yeast, the yeast extract, <clears throat> excuse me, and that goes into other ingredients, your new probe, some of the um, chelated minerals and the cell flux. You take the outer cell wall, the walls of that cell, and that's what becomes your mananolagosaccharide or your biomass. Um, and that inner cell wall is what, that glucan is what goes into your mold inhibitor. So just from that one whole yeast, we can break it down into the different sections and really highlight different benefits of the yeast. <clears throat> So a lot of the question when you're feeding these probiotics and prebiotics is, is it going to get to the hindgut of the horse? I wanted to show you the digestive system of the horse first so that you realize where all of this is working. It's not working in the stomach or the small intestine. It's working in the hindgut. So these ingredients have to get to the hindgut. They have to be encapsulated. They have to be able to withstand the acid in the stomach, and the enzymes in the small intestine. So this is looking at the yeast sac 1026 that we use from Alltech in our digestive supplements, and it's looking, so it's feeding it to the horse and then actually looking at the amount of that that's in the cecum and the colon. And you've got, we've got, you know, billions and billions of coliforming units. This is how you measure that yeast and bacteria in CFUs per gram. Um, in the hindgut. So it's making there. So if anyone's arguing, oh, is it really making it? Yes, the research is showing it absolutely makes it there. And this is old research from 1999. So it's not new. We've been able to get the yeast to the right part of the digestive system for, you know, over 17 years. So let's look at the effect of adding yeast to a diet and look at, so the streptococcus these are the bacteria that are going to make acid. They're going to make that acidic environment. The lactic acid utilizing bacteria, these are the ones when we have that very um, high grain diet, these are the ones that usually fall off. And it's really hard to keep boosting those so that they're keeping up with using that acid and making it that pH stabilize. So the white bars, that's when we feed a pelleted feed, a barley, a high barley, high starch feed, okay? And we've got, you can see, the streptococcus, the lactic acid producing bacteria, they proliferate. But the lactic acid utilizing bacteria, they're not doing so well. Kind of, they're, they're decreasing. When you add yeast to that really uh, starchy diet, you can see we can now suppress some of those lactic acid producing bacteria. So we're stabilizing the acid. We're not letting that acid get too strong, which is going on to cause colic, gastric ulcers, hindgut ulcers, etc. And you can see this is really neat here. Those bacteria that are able to utilize that acid, these are the ones that are responsible for keeping the pH stable. When you add yeast to the diet, 
those bacteria just are able to proliferate. They do fantastic. This is what I was talking about earlier. This is the small intestine of the horse. And this is the um, this is looking at starch intake. <clears throat> and if we start, remember I showed you that 0.4% of body weight. This is here, right here. Right here at this point, around 400 grams per day or, or, or 400 grams per kilogram of feed. That point there is when we just can't digest any more starch. So that starch goes somewhere and it goes into the hindgut of the horse. So we make sure that number one, we're feeding small meals often. And number two, we need to be processing the grains, steam flaked barley, steam flaked corn. Um, and also we're adding things to the diet that are going to help. If some of the starch is getting into the hindgut of the horse and those lactic acid producing bacteria are going crazy, then we need to make sure that we're adding ingredients that are going to help stabilize that pH. <clears throat> Another one. Okay, so let's look at after you fed the horse, that really strong pelleted, bar pelleted barley diet is full of, ass full of um, <clears throat> starch. This lactate here, we're looking, these bars are representing acid, lactic acid. So after the meal, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, for 11 hours after that meal, we have this really acidic environment in the hindgut. But add yeast sac to it, we get a slight increase around three hours. But then it's really stable. We don't have that huge bump in acid that's causing those colonic ulcers and that hindgut disruption. Um, now let's look at the digestibility um, because not only are we stabilizing that pH, but if we're stabilizing that pH, we're be increasing the ability of those good bugs, those fibrous bacteria, the bacteria that are digesting fiber, we call them fibrolytic bacteria, they're able to do their job better because now we're in an environment they like. Um, and so they're really digesting fiber better. So let's look at these gestating mares. They're in the 11th month of pregnancy. Any women out there that have been pregnant, you know by that last that last part of pregnancy, you're eating a lot. In mares, you need to make sure that that food is actually able to be digested. They're getting as much as they can out of it because they're going to have to produce milk soon. And a lot of mares really struggle when they have that befall and they're producing milk. They lose a lot of weight um, because they're just not able to keep up. So look at when you add yeast to the diet. These mares, these fibrous, this ADF and NDF, which are measures of digestibility and palatability, and the crude protein and the non-digestible fiber portion, you can see that when you add yeast to the diet and all of these fractions, we're able to get these mares to get more out. They're able to digest. They're able to get more protein out of the feed that you're feeding them, which is good because they need to put that protein into milk, into, into um, supporting that fall. Mineral digestibility, it's not just about fiber digestibility. It's also about calcium and phosphorus, which are really, really critical to foals and to mares. You can see when you add yeast to the diet, they're going to get more phosphorus and more calcium out of the forage that you're feeding them. Some of you have seen this before. Bone strength in young horses. Bone strength in young horses, when mares are fed um, yeast added to, you know, these high, these NRC recommended amounts of calcium and phosphorus, their bone strength is much higher. Look at this. This pink line is 100% of the NRC requirement for calcium plus yeast. And you can see that at falling all the way through to 40 weeks, these falls have much higher bone strength. 
um, <clears throat> compared to the green line here, which is 100% of calcium with no yeast. With her height, well, at birth, it's not significantly different, but by 42 and 56 days of age, so, you know, a month to two months of age, these foals that are from mares that were being supplemented with yeast that 20 grams a day, they had higher wither height because those mares have much more potent milk. If we go now to those, um, looking at the moss, horses, they're surrounding everything we do with two horses stresses them. Stresses them how? Stresses the gut. That's the first thing that gets stressed. If you think, oh, my horse has a behavioral issue, I think he's stressed by his environment, that's a secondary. Him flicking his head around or being spooky or spinning in the stall, that's secondary. The very first place that gets stressed is the gut. So the disease, the bacteria in the environment, the microbes, the, the exercise stress, that all affects the gut first. And then the actual symptoms that you see, the diarrhea, the nervous horse, that is all because of what's occurred in the gut. At the level of the microbes, everything's already changed by the time you see your horse being a little nervous or you see some um, bacteria, or some loose manure. So the bacteria. It clears out bad bugs. It leaves the good bugs, guts, bugs. It feeds the good bugs. This helps the immune system. It reduces the need for antibiotics. <clears throat> Let's look at this. These, these pictures here are actually of the, the digestive system. These are of the hindgut. These little wormy looking things are actually normal. These are under a huge, uh, a very powerful microscope. And these are called villi, and they actually increase the surface area. So these are normal little little wavy fingers. What you're looking at is this frothy, cobwebby looking stuff. That's bad. That's bacteria. That is bacteria proliferating, attaching to the intestinal wall and proliferating. If you don't feed the animal any kind of uh, probiotic, prebiotic, or antibiotic, you can see that um, when they're infected with a, a, a pathogen, salmonella, E. coli, you can see it all. When you feed them an antibiotic, it starts to break it down. You can see it starting to break away. Look at what the biomass, though. I don't see any of that cobwebby stuff because it's not even getting, giving it the opportunity to attach to the intestinal wall. It's the biomass is binding it before it ever attaches and flushing it out the digestive system. If we look at the one animal where we really know that there is a huge time of um, risk with immunity. So when the foal is born, they get this instantaneous, what we call passive immunity, passive transfer. It's the colostrum. They're getting some antibodies from the mare's colostrum. But then between day one and day 14, before that foal is actually building its own active immune system, so its own, it's proliferating its own gut with bacteria and building its own immune system, we've got this 13-day window where they're at real high risk. <clears throat> Diarrhea is going to be the first thing you're going to see in a neonatal foal. Um, organisms that will challenge the foal, Clostridium, Salmonella, uh, the colostrum from the fall is a source of antibodies, and these are some, some values here that you look at in the different immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, IgM. The fall can only absorb these antibodies during that first 24 hours of life, though. So that's why it's so critical that that may or, that fall gets that colostrum. Um, you, you, when we take these blood samples to see if that, that fall got successful passive transfer from the colostrum, we're going to look at around greater than 800 milligrams of Ig um, per deciliter. Partial around 200 to 400, but failure is less than 200. <clears throat> when you feed moss, biomass, you're increasing those colostrum immunoglobulins by 30 to 50 percent. The three-day milk Igs. 30 to 100%, and the false serum IgM and IgA is increased by 50 to 75%. And now this isn't feeding the foal that. This is 
feeding the fall then when the mayor is getting these the moss the this boost in immune system through the mayor's milk so let's look at our products the probiotic paste the probiotic paste is literally just probiotics it's lactic acid bacteria lactobacillus acidophilus so this is that live bacteria that's going to go into the gut it's going to make it into the the hind gut of the horse and it's going to help support <clears throat> this good bacteria um, organisms that produce lactic acid help to maintain that slightly envir acidic environment in the hind gut <coughs> which is non hospitable to pathogens on the flip side though if you've got a horse that's got a lot of diarrhea <clears throat> that is actually coming from them eating too much grain. So we already know we've got a pretty acidic um, environment in the hindgut due to high grain diet. Then the pro paste may not be the first port of call for you. But if your horse has been on antibiotics and we need to proliferate all of the bacteria, um, or we've got a pathogenic diarrhea, like we know it's E. coli or salmonella, then the pro paste is good. But if we know that it's from <clears throat> a high grain diet and we know the horse has got a lot of acid in the gut already, maybe not the pro paste. The digestive feed additive or the DDA, um, it's got your live cell, it's got your yeast in it, it's got your biomass in it, it's got a mold binder in it, it's got some minerals, um, <clears throat> it's got some of your direct fed microbials or your probiotics. So this is kind of a probiotic, prebiotic mix. Um, when we look at, if I go back to um, the comments that the reps had sub submitted a while ago, um, if anybody uh, kind of uses this terminology in red where they recommend the pro paste because as worming allows for the, all the bad bacteria to be taken out of the body, Probiotics and prebiotics will not affect uh, parasites in the system. They will do nothing for bacteria. <clears throat> Some horses, it stresses the gut when you feed a dewormer. <clears throat> it may become a little more acidic um, just due to a stress. So after deworming, you can feed a probiotic or your DDA or your propase because sometimes it really does uh, – uh, the horse's gut gets stressed. I mean, there's a bunch of things that you can all read these without me um, having to go through them. But <clears throat> the digestive feed additive, we've kind of gone through the ingredients. We've gone through the chelated, the, the, the yeast sac. We've gone through the biomass. We've gone through where this is going to work. Rescue aid. Rescue aid is also high doses of your yeast, your Saccharomyces cerevisiae, as well as your direct fed microbials, your bacteria. <clears throat> if you're transporting horses, if you've got horses under high amounts of stress, uh, this is ideal. The paste, the paste is actually oh, wow, I went the wrong direction, sorry. The paste is now a replica of the um the powder and it's also got uh an equine antibody concentrate in it which is going to also be boosting immune system uh and if you look in the ingredients you'll see whole egg powder and you're like well where, why am i feeding eggs to my horses you're not feeding eggs you're feeding an antibody that's coming out of the egg <clears throat> more concentrated more accelerated version of the dda dda every horse every day feed it all the time the rescue aid is, on the rescue aid paste is more of a therapeutic dose. Now I want to finish with this because I have um, sorry, I'm reading someone's comment. Um, I have had this question a lot. I've got some reps that are more comfortable in the Western world or some dealers that are more comfortable in the Western world. <coughs> Some are more comfortable talking to the Amish. Some are more comfortable in the English world. Do you know what that horse does by looking at his digestive system? If we were all in the room together, I would hope you'd all put your hand up and say, no, 
No one has a clue whether this is an Amish buggy horse or it's a Kentucky Derby winner or whether it's going to jump jumps or, you know, go around barrels. Inside, the horse is all the same. The digestive system doesn't care what kind of clothes the kid wears when they ride the horse. So do not be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Just because you feel like you can talk about Western or you can talk about barrel racing, the gut of the horse does not differentiate between discipline. It is the same. It does not vary with function nor activity. From the digestive standpoint, a horse is a horse. And I want to leave you with that because I've gotten that comment frequently from reps and dealers, being a little uncomfortable about going into an arena that, you know, maybe you don't wear a cowboy hat or maybe you do and you're worried about going into a dressage ring. Hold on to the notion, to the to the knowledge, to the pure fact that inside the horse's gut, you know what you're talking about. Cowboy hat or top hat or Amish hat, inside the horse is all the same. So I'm going to put that back up. <clears throat> I'm going to ask for questions. Questions. Unmuted. Everybody's unmuted. Please go ahead and know. ask questions. Um, okay. No one got any questions? Can you feed cool gut long term? This question comes from New York. Should you continue with DDA and cool gut? The DDA is one. Feed it all the time, every day, all horses. The cool gut, if you don't change the horse's environment, then yeah, you gotta keep feeding it. But let's say we take a red a racehorse, we take him off the track. And we're going to put him in a training program. You may only need one bout of cool gut. So the cool gut can be fed long term, but it doesn't. The DDA, I want you to feed that every day to every horse. Hold on, the back end. Say that again. Yeah, I think it's one of our school is telling. I'm rolling my chest. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off the recording. Um, 